Hello, this is Michael Altos, and we are in our physiology course, starting the section on cardiac. This is part one. Let's begin with a discussion of the gross anatomy of the heart. The heart is actually one organ that has two parallel pumps, a left side and a right side. Each side has an atrium, which is a conduit and a priming chamber, and a ventricle, which is the actual pump. The left and the right sides are divided by a septum, or a septal wall. The right side of the heart receives deoxygenated, deoxygenated blood from the systemic circulation. The superior and inferior, cava, inferior vena cava deliver deoxygenated blood, and then the right ventricle pumps blood out to the pulmonary circulation where gas exchange can occur. When blood returns from the lungs, it returns to the left side, where the, blood is, where the oxygenated blood can be delivered to the left atrium, then to the left ventricle, and out through the aorta to the systemic circulation. The heart contains four valves, which ensure one-way flow. The AV valves, the atrial ventricular valves, the tricuspid on the right, and the mitral valve on the left, and then two semilunar valves, the pulmonary valve leading out of the right ventricle, and the aortic valve leading out of the left ventricle. <clears throat> now let's talk about cardiac muscle cells. This is a continuation of what we were discussing in the introduction. We've learned about action potentials and resting membrane potentials. So now we can see, when we look at a cardiac muscle cell, that it has a resting membrane potential close to 90, negative 90 millivolts. Phase zero is called the depolarization. The sodium channel is open. The membrane potential becomes much more positive as sodium rapidly flows into the cell and depolarizes it. We then have our phase one, which is an initial repolarization, followed by a plateau phase, which we discussed previously, due to some slower channels. Calcium channels open as the fast potassium channels close. This plateau allows sustained cardiac contraction. Then we have rapid repolarization as the calcium channels close and slow potassium channels open. The plateau ends and we return towards our resting membrane potential. And phase four is back at the resting membrane potential, again about negative 90 millivolts, established by our sodium potassium pump. Once the heart cell has gone through this process, it goes into a refractory period, which lasts a few hundred milliseconds. And during that time, cardiac muscles are unable to be re-excited. The cardiac cycle is divided into two parts, systole and diastole. Systole is when the ventricles contract and the heart squeezes. Diastole is when the ventricle relaxes and the heart is able to fill with blood. Just a few points to get us started here. The aortic and the pulmonic valves open after ventricular contraction begins, which means to say first it contracts and builds up pressure, and then, afterwards, the valves open and blood begins to eject. Similarly, the mitral and tricuspid valves open after ventricular relaxation. The ventricle relaxes, it starts to expand in volume, although no blood is coming in, and then these valves open. This is significant because we see the generation of positive and negative pressures in the ventricular chambers. We call this isometric or isovolumic contraction and relaxation. The blood isn't yet moving in or out of the ventricle, even though it's starting to contract or relax. We'll discuss this more on the next slide. Heart sounds, which we'll discuss again in a few minutes, correspond to the closure of the different valves. Another thing to be aware of is that the atria can contract. That helps fill the ventricles. But blood does passively flow from the atria to the ventricles even, below, even before they start to contract. 
However, the ventricles do rely on some atrial contraction. About 20 to 30 percent of ventricular filling is due to contraction of the atria. So with some of these points in mind, we can look at a diagram like this. And this diagram is reproduced in your notes as well as in the text. These diagrams are very useful. This shows the entire heart cycle, systole and diastole. We see how it corresponds to the EKG, where systole and ventricular contraction begins with the QRS complex. We can see the period of isovolumic con contraction, where the AV valve has closed, the mitral and tricuspid valves, but the aortic valve hasn't opened yet. During this time, pressures in the ventricle go way up. Pressures in the aorta haven't changed yet because no blood has been ejected. When the aortic valve opens, then pressures continue to rise as blood is ejected from the ventricle into the aorta. And then as the ventricle empties, pressure begins to fall. And it continues to fall until the aortic valve closes. At that point, blood is trapped past the aortic valve in the aorta, and those pressures remain relatively high. But the ventricular pressure continues to fall as the heart chamber relaxes, and pressures continue to fall until finally the AV valve opens and blood can flow in from the atrium. At this point, we are in diastole, where the ventricle is filling as blood moves from the atrium to the ventricle. Here we see a little bit of atrial systole, a little bit of atrial contraction, giving some filling to the ventricle. And then the process begins again. We also see the heart sounds, the first sound corresponding with closure of the AV valves, and the second sound corresponding with closure of the aortic valve. Let's talk more about the valves of the heart. The AV valves, the tricuspid and the mitral valves, prevent backwards blood flow from the ventricles to the atria during systole. These valves are responsible for the first heart sound, which we call S1. And this sound is due to the closure of the AV valves at the start of systole. The AV valves are notable for papillary muscles, which are small muscles on the inside of the heart wall, and they attach to the cusps of the valve by little structures called chordae tendinae, and these prevent the valvular leaflets from regurgitating backwards. The semilunar valves, the pulmonic and aortic valves, prevent backflow from the pulmonary artery or the aorta back into the ventricles during diastole. These valves are responsible for the second heart sound, which is the closure of the semilunar valves at the end of systole. Normally the S2 valve is actually split because the pulmonary valve closes a little bit after the aortic valve, and this split is more pronounced during inspiration, and you can hear it if you listen carefully. Both the AV valves and the semilunar valves open and close passively in response to the pressure gradients that occur during the cardiac cycle. A little more about heart sounds. The heart sounds are not actually due to the valve leaflets slapping together, but rather due to vibration of the taut valve leaflets after they close. We spoke about the first and second heart sounds, but there are other heart sounds. There are third and fourth heart sounds that can sometimes be heard. The third heart sound occurs during the middle of diastole, a lot of people remember it with the phrase Kentucky, where Kentuck is our normal S1 and S2, bum bum, bum bum, and the third heart sound is right after the second, Kentucky, Kentucky, where the E is the third heart sound. This occurs often in people with systolic heart failure, but it can also be normal in younger adults and in children. There's a fourth heart sound which occurs right before the first heart sound, People remember it with the phrase Tennessee, where the 10 is the fourth heart sound. Tennessee, 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 where the 10 is the fourth heart sound. This is called an atrial contraction sound and is sometimes associated with left ventricular hypertrophy.
Each of the four valves can be best heard in a different place on the heart, on the chest wall, with the aortic best heard on the right upper sternal border at the second intercostal space, pulmonic on the left side of the sternum, and tricuspid and mitral down closer to the fifth intercostal space. Murmurs are graded on a scale of one to six, at least systolic murmurs are, where grade one is very faint, something that probably only an experienced cardiologist might be able to hear. Moving up through grades two, three, and four, which is quite loud and can even be felt when you put your hand on the chest, grades five and six being so loud that you can start to hear them with, through your stethoscope, even if it's not completely contacting the chest. We see a variety of different heart sounds here, and I'll demonstrate just a few of them for you. Here we have a regular heart sound. S1 and S2 with no other murmurs. Next to it, we have aortic stenosis, a systolic ejection murmur. Sometimes you can't hear the first heart sound because of the murmur. The murmur of mitral regurgitation is also a systolic murmur, but more of a holosystolic murmur. The murmur of aortic stenosis tends to radiate up towards the neck and can be heard in the carotid arteries, while the murmur of mitral regurgitation tends to radiate laterally and can be heard in the axilla on the left side. Finally, one diastolic murmur for you. This is aortic regurgitation, which occurs after the second heart sound. Let's talk for just a few minutes about some specific valve lesions and how we approach them in anesthesia. The first and one of the most common is aortic stenosis. This is a narrow opening of the aortic valve. If you measure the cross-sectional area of the aortic valve, it's usually two to four square centimeters. As we said, as the valve narrows, we start to have a harsh systolic murmur during systole that radiates to the neck. Aortic stenosis can be classified as mild, moderate, severe, or critical. As the valvulopathy gets worse, the pressure gradient across the valve increases and aortic valve area decreases. The mnemonic for anesthetic goals in patients with aortic stenosis is slow sinus and SVR. We want them to be slow because a slow heart rate allows adequate time for ejection during systole. Remember, the ventricle is trying to squeeze out as much blood as possible through a very narrow opening. The more time it has to do that, the more blood it can eject. Therefore, we want to have a nice full ventricle. In order to get ventricular filling, we want to be in sinus rhythm so we can get that atrial kick to help get the ventricle as full as possible. SVR, or afterload, which we'll talk about later, means to maintain sufficient blood pressure. And this is primarily to ensure good perfusion of the coronary arteries, which we will see later occurs during diastole and occurs better with higher blood pressure. Patients who have aortic stenosis start to develop concentric thickening of their left ventricle due to these high pressures that it's generating. But it also increases myocardial demand for oxygen and it reduces compliance. A pulmonary artery catheter may be useful in these patients. They may benefit from vasodilators, but as we'll talk about later, measuring pulmonary wedge pressures may be inaccurate because of their reduced left ventricular compliance. Probably most important to remember is that patients with severe aortic stenosis 
are not good candidates for spinal and maybe even epidural anesthesia. This is true for patients with moderate or severe aortic stenosis, and that's due to the inability to maintain SVR. On the other hand, we can have aortic regurgitation or aortic insufficiency. This is where the valve is incompetent and there's backflow during the valve, backflow through the valve during diastole. These patients develop an eccentric left ventricular hypertrophy and the ventricle dilates due to the very high ventricular volumes as blood fills both from the incompetent aortic valve as well as naturally through the mitral valve. Because blood flows back from the aorta, diastolic pressures tend to be low, and coronary blood flow may be compromised. Many patients with aortic regurgitation are asymptomatic until very late in the disease. As the left ventricle becomes more and more dilated with volume, mitral regurgitation can also occur. The murmur of aortic regurgitation is a blowing high-pitched murmur that occurs during diastole. In these patients, our anesthetic goals are summarized by the mnemonic fast, forward, and full. We want these patients to have a faster heart rate because as the heart rate gets slower, there's more time for regurgitation, which we want to avoid. We should keep the heart rate closer to the 80 to 100 range. We want less afterload in order to allow as much blood as possible to be ejected into the aorta, since we know that some of it is going to come back. And we want to maintain a nice full heart that is maintained preload in order to maximize, again, the amount of blood that can be ejected into the aorta. These patients may also benefit from monitoring with a pulmonary artery catheter, especially if they have acute aortic regurgitation or a very severe chronic regurgitation or if they're on vasodilators. Epidural and spinal anesthesia are probably okay in these patients as long as you maintain adequate volume status. Now we're going to discuss some lesions of the mitral valve. The first is mitral stenosis. A normal mitral stenosis has a valve area of four to six square centimeters, and symptoms don't really begin until below two centimeters squared. And critical mitral stenosis is considered to be below one square centimeter, and these patients are symptomatic at rest. The symptoms may include pulmonary edema, dyspnea, which is shortness of breath, PND, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, where they wake up gasping for breath during the night. They may have chest pain or palpitations or true atrial fibrillation because of the stretching of the atrium. They may develop hemoptysis due to this pulmonary edema, so they're coughing up blood. Some patients may have hoarseness. As the heart hypertrophies, it can lead to stretching on the recurrent laryngeal nerve. As pulmonary venous pressures increase, this back pressure eventually can lead to potential pulmonary hypertension as left atrial pressures exceed 25 millimeters of mercury. The hallmark murmur of mitral stenosis is a diastolic murmur because this is blood coming into the ventricle from the atrium during diastole. It tends to be a low-pitched murmur. It can be sort of a crescendo decrescendo murmur and it's sort of low-pitched and rumbling and is best heard at the apex or the tip of the heart. When taking care of patients with mitral stenosis, our goals are once again slow and sinus. And this is a hallmark of the stenotic lesions that once again, we want to keep the heart rate slow so there's plenty of time to move blood through that stenotic valve. These patients really rely on their atrial kick to get adequate filling from the atrium into the ventricle. And so therefore sinus rhythm is really important. We want to do everything we can to help that process by maintaining preload and volume status, as well as good contractility. We also want patients to have adequate systemic and pulmonary vascular resistance. As we saw above, elevated left atrial pressures above about 25 millimeters of mercury can lead to acute pulmonary edema. So we don't want to overdo it with these patients either as far as volume status. The last lesion that we're going to discuss is mitral regurgitation where blood flows backwards through the mitral valve during systole. In these patients, we want to maintain an elevated heart rate, not too high, but 80 to 100. We don't want too much preload or afterload 
Acute mitral regurgitation occurs in patients who may otherwise have normal hearts. This can occur after a myocardial infarction or some other injury. And so their pulmonary vascular um, congestion will occur quickly because their system is not really designed to handle this sudden change in hemodynamics. And pulmonary edema is likely to result. But patients who have chronic mitral regurgitation will have increased atrial compliance to make up for the flow of blood backwards back into the left atrium. And so they'll tend to have a lower cardiac output. These patients can be categorized into mild, moderate, and severe, depending on what percentage of the total stroke volume is moving backwards through the mitral valve into the left atrium instead of forward out the heart through the aortic valve. So as it goes from 30 to 60 to greater than 60%, these patients can go from mild to moderate to severe category. Neuraxial anesthesia is probably okay in these patients, but we do want to avoid bradycardia. And since bradycardia can be a side effect of a higher neuraxial anesthetic, we definitely want to be careful to treat that if it starts to occur. The classic uh, murmur of mitral regurgitation is a holosystolic murmur. Uh, some call it a pan-systolic murmur, and it's during systole, and the murmur extends all the way through to the S2 heart sound. Once again, it's heard best at the apex, and it tends to radiate towards the axilla. We'll stop here with this section. Please do let me know if you have any questions. You can drop me an email or bring those questions to class, and we'll continue in the next video recording.